It is so great to be here with you this morning. Let's worship God and give Him all we got. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met. Give me wisdom Cause you know 
as a Lutheran at the age of two months old. I grew up in church. My parents separated when I was around 10 years old. I ended up joining the Navy when I was 17 years old. And before that even, I got mixed up into drugs and alcohol at a young age. I think I was 11 the first time I drank. And I started smoking pot probably the following year. And I just recently got married to my wife Carrie. That's how I ended up becoming a member here at East Point because she was already a, a member and I started attending service with her. My experience of attending East Point for the first time, the biggest thing was I could feel God's presence. I, I can feel the Holy Spirit in my heart. I've learned a lot in the last year. Going to the men's meeting or going to the couples Bible studies has really made a difference and I'm trying to get into the you know read the Bible on a daily basis I've learned to like become humble and you know just let things go I know that's a result of learning more about Jesus and how he dealt you know with, with people and I'm trying to you know replicate that with my myself. This baptism to me means I basically will be wiped of all my sins that I've committed in the past. My name is Keith Becker and I today declare Jesus is my Lord.
just know what to do. Father God, you are so, so good and worthy of our praise. And I just can't imagine the party going on in heaven right now for every one soul that comes back to you, Jesus. And I thank you that we get to be a part of that party right down here on earth, God. Lord, I just thank you so much that we can approach your throne boldly and with confidence because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. I thank you that we don't have to come and say, I'm not worthy, but you have made us worthy through your blood. And I thank you that we can stand boldly and we can say, God, you are our father and we are your children and we love you with all that we have. God, increase that love in this church. Father God, increase that love for the lost in us. Father God, increase Increase that love for the children, for the youth, for the elderly, Father God, for the disabled, Lord, increase that love, Father God. Take away anything that binds us, anything that blinds us, Father God, and open us up to live more freely, more boldly, more humbly, and in awe of who you are and what you do when we are willing to lay down our lives and pick up your cross, Father God. And I just thank you. I thank you that we have that opportunity, Lord. I just thank you that we can serve you in every way, shape, and form with all of our heart, with all the gifts that you've given each and every one of us, that none of them go to waste, God. That you open doors that no one can shut, Lord. Continue to grow us, strengthen us. Oh, Father, help us to trust you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
salvation. You broke the curse for our freedom. Oh, Jesus, you You know, worship is the act of ascribing worth that is due to something. When we understand the value of something, we, we ascribe worth by how we treat it, right? If you, if you had a precious diamond in your hand, you wouldn't treat it like, uh, you know, an empty cup of coffee and throw it in your back seat. You would you'd treat it like it's valuable. You'd find it uh, a safe place to put it. You'd know where it is. You'd put it in a safe and ascribe value to that thing. When we come into the presence of God in worship, and we're ascribing value and worth to the most precious thing, to Jesus, the, the Savior of our souls, to the creator of the universe. And so many of us, we come in and we raise our hands or we bow down or we sing in worship. Why? Because... Jesus alone is worthy of the most precious parts of our heart. Amen? Amen. You know, every week we, we take a moment here and we, we worship with our giving. We worship through our offerings. And, and I realize many of you give online or you give on your way in and the boxes in the back. But regardless of when we give, it's this act of worship, declaring, God, you are worthy of the first fruits of of our labor, you're worthy of, of our finances, and we trust you to provide for us. We trust you to provide for the church family, the community that we're in, and so we give in an act of worship, amen? So I just wanna take a minute, and I wanna pray over, over that as an act of worship. Pray over our giving, pray over the offerings that have been given today, because I believe it is just as significant, just as important as the songs that we sing, amen? Let me pray. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. God, may you reveal to each person today how valuable you are, how much worth you have. God, reveal to me 
even more just how precious you are in my life, that I may worship you with everything I am, everything I have, my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength would go toward worshiping the creator, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We praise you and we thank you for who you are. And so God, as we give, we do so as an act of worship, saying that you you get it all, you own it all, but God, we give that and we're generous, God, because we wanna worship you with our finances, with who we are. So we praise you and we thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. What, amen. Well, hey, welcome to East Point. We're so glad you're here. Hey, before you sit down, (laughs) we're gonna do something a little different from now on in our services. Are you ready for this? Uh, We realize we're, we're a church family and we're a big church family. And we realize that oftentimes size can be a little overwhelming, that, that it may feel difficult to connect with other people here in the service. And so we're going to do something a little different moving forward. After these moments of transition, we're going to take a minute, we're going to turn around, and we're going to greet some people that are near us, maybe people that you don't know. And I realize that for some of you, this could be very uncomfortable, right? We got some introverts in the house, but here's... Here's why we're doing this. We want to be the people that we say we are. When we talk about church family, when we talk about community and the importance of it, we want to start to prioritize that even on Sunday mornings. And so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release you right now to turn around, find someone near you, ask them their names and maybe how long they've been here at East Point. Quiet down in here. How was that? Are we a family? You all didn't just hear me, but I was screaming down the hallway saying, it's working. We have a church family and we've always been a family, but now we get to know each other. You ever been to one of those reunions? They happen in the county all the time. 78 people come to one person's one acre backyard and you're introduced to all your family every year. You you don't know them. Well, in all seriousness, as we step into this season on Vision Sunday, this season of of reaching into Jesus' teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, this is what the crowd would have been like in the Sermon on the Mount. A community that that everyone, a lot of people knew each other. They're they're milling around. They're following this this miracle-working Rabbi Jesus to to this, this place of his teaching but there was this community. There was this this relational aspect that I think we as a church, not just here at East Point, but all across the country, we've we've turned church sometimes too much into a TED Talk plus Jesus, right? But yet we're a family. We're a family. So 
I'm an extrovert, I know. This is like, this is the most exciting part of all of today was that moment right there. And I know there's people in this room that have literally got a phone call and said, I come here so you won't talk to me. And if that's you, it's because we love you. Jesus meant you for relationship. Now that was a little intrusive maybe, right? So if people are like, ah, this is a little much for me, that's okay. Hang out in your seat, reflect on, on the morning, reflect on getting our hearts settled. But if you can just meet one person, the people around you probably are really good cooks. So just invite yourself to lunch and then you get to, you get to know each other. So for my wife and I, this is a big part. We were part of this church family. We used to sit right over here in this column and we started to understand who sat around us and our friends would be with us. We kind of developed this tribe and it was a family. And so we're trying to help foster that here. Um, one thing I just want to highlight, I want to highlight it till I'm blue in the face. So if you can help me out, lean in life groups. We have so many willing leaders. Actually, if you're a leader of a life group or class right now, would you just stand up in this auditorium really quick? If you're leading a group, a class, if you're available. Man, oh man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. These people are opening their homes, they're making way in their calendar, they're there. To, to connect, to be able to disciple, to be able to point us toward Jesus. And so today is the last day of registration. Community is so important. We're going to jump into the teachings of Jesus and we, as we continue through the fall. And we want to do that in circles and in homes and in discussion where we can ask these questions. So please, 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 if you want to connect with a group, if you want to know if there's groups near you or a demographic that fits your season of life, Discovery East Point in front of the welcome desk is where you can connect with Graham and Zoe. A few of us, uh, other of us staff are going to be over there to help plug people in. Life group leaders, this is the reading plan for this, this semester on the back. And this is for our church family too as well. We have 36 weeks of a reading plan in the Word of God to help you journey with Jesus together. And so the hope is, get this. We read and we engage Jesus throughout the week and we show up in our small group and we talk about what Jesus is doing in our life. Right? So often we, we lean on the discussion, we lean on the teaching, which is good, or, or we show up and we say, well, I liked it when Graham said, or I liked it when Kenan said, or I liked it, I really liked it when Matt said. Right? Like, well, how about what Jesus said? Right? How are we letting him really work in our lives and be able to connect in these small groups? So anyways, life group leaders, if you're looking for these cards, grab a dozen of them. They'll be in the Discovery East Point room as well. And they'll be, uh, they'll be there for you. So today is our block party. Final announcement. Our block party is going to be crazy fun this afternoon. We'll be starting at one o'clock. Anybody that's like, hey, I'm going to be around. If you need any help, you can meet some of the team out at the welcome desk. We're going to be setting up in the parking lot. So thank you, roadies, for orchestrating everything this morning. I'm sorry if there's any frustration. Trust us. It'll be for the better to not have your car stuck in a bunch of cones for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> right? So um, we're excited for our block party, one o'clock, and we'll be jamming out there in the parking lot with our community in our church family. So if you're a guest tuning in online, so glad to have you this morning. Big welcome to Cumberland County Jail, our campus down the road. Love our brothers and sisters there. God's doing amazing things in that community and we are excited to be a part of it. And if you're a guest today, would love to meet you, would love to get to know you. I bet 17 people just met you here in this room. So we'd love to, love to connect outside of the auditorium at the welcome booth. So as we head into this next season of ministry and life here at East Point, one of the things that we want to really double down on is the idea that Jesus's kingdom is at hand. That his kingdom, his reign, rule, and authority in our lives is here and now. You know, we often, we often confuse sometimes the kingdom that Jesus brought and heaven itself where God resides. Right? And so many of us think, well, if I just, if I just do the deed, if I'm, I'm just a part of the church, if I, if I confess that Jesus is Lord, I get my fire insurance, I get my ticket into heaven, and now we sit and wait. How many of us know that's no life to live? That's not the life that Jesus has for us. And yet Jesus was so intentional in teaching about his kingdom. And his, his kingdom teaching didn't necessarily 
come at the very end of his life where he just said, hey, look at all that I've done. Jesus so wisely began his ministry teaching about his kingdom. Right? He cast a vision for his kingdom. And many people would think, well, if he's a king, then he sits on his throne. And before all of the land that he would declare his kingdom was ruling in the land. But how many of us know that's not the rabbi that we follow? That's not the king of our hearts. Our king came with a different kingdom. And so for you and I as followers of Jesus, or if you're new to the church, or if you're exploring who Jesus is, one thing that I want to share is it's one thing to declare that Jesus is Lord. It's another to live our lives in that reality. Right? It's easy to say that we love the idea of King Jesus, but how hard is it to be in submission to his authority in our lives? This is the invitation that Jesus has for his followers as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And I assure you, if you set out with me today and we as a church family read through those three chapters every single week, I assure you, you'd find deeper and deeper riches all the way through the end of the year. Because that's what he has for us. This, this, there's no bottom to the deep end of the pool with Jesus. His kingdom permeates our hearts. His culture of what he's ushering in completely transforms our lives day by day, but it's when we're submitted to him as king. Right, this whole world that we live in, we want the ideas of a kingdom. We want the love, the joy, the peace but we don't want the king. Today, at East Point Christian Church, we declare that Jesus is Lord and he is king of our lives. Now tomorrow, when you're heading to work and you're five minutes late already, because uh, someone unplugged your curling iron or your coffee wasn't made, and you come upon that traffic at 805 on Running Hill Road in Scarborough, Jesus is still king. Right. And the fruit will bear in your life as a result. And so for us, the journey is to not just celebrate on Sunday, but every day of the week, waking up, greeting the person of God and saying, I'm submitting myself to your authority again today. You are Lord again today. What Keith declared in the presence of all of us today is an every single day declaration that Jesus is Lord. And I've seen the fruit in his life as a result. I get the privilege of being in a men's group with Keith and many of those guys around that tub. And our pursuit is not just Sunday, it's every single day, humbling ourselves, submitting ourselves to his authority. And so as we look at the Sermon on the Mount and we, we cast the vision of the next season to come here at this church, it's Jesus' vision of his kingdom. And so I just want to set the stage a little bit because Jesus doesn't necessarily begin his earthly ministry as you and I would hope a king would, right? We would think, a, again, a king sits in his throne. He sends out his messengers. He starts declaring the kingdom coming. He comes in force and power, chariots and, and, and horsemen, right? That, that this would be a full-on onslaught to just take the territory. We wouldn't think that our king would come into one of the poorest areas of Israel in Nazareth born as a carpenter's son. We wouldn't think of him as a sandal-wearing rabbi that wanders around the northern region of Galilee. Or that he goes into the wilderness after being baptized to pray and fast. Right? That he allows his camel skin wearing, honey locust eating cousin to dunk him underwater to bring his authority of the kingdom. And surely his army should not be made up of fishermen and tax collectors. And yet this is who our king is. And as we look around, we're no different than the people who followed him that day. Because Jesus didn't come to declare his kingdom in Jerusalem, the holy city. He's in the northern region of Galilee. This beautiful, picturesque lake that has these rolling mountains that climb up to the sky. and The greenery that's just unbelievable. This is where Jesus, our Messiah, came to begin the kingdom coming here on earth in the hearts of men and women. And so just to set the stage, Matthew chapter 4, the end of it in verses 23 through 25, this is the beginning of the king coming here on earth. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. 
News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region all across the Jordan followed him. Not chariots, not horses, not swords, not spears, no trumpet declaring. He healed people. And there's people in this room that no matter the authority that exists in the government and the land, we desperately need a healing. Our hearts are broken. Maybe our bodies are broken. Maybe we're suffering. Our relationships are broken. I'll tell you what, Jesus is in the healing business today. Jesus is in the healing business. And his, when his kingdom comes, when he proclaims his good news, when we proclaim his good news, here healing comes in Jesus' name in people's lives. It does. It's a result of his spirit. And so what happens? All of the crowds gather around him. Just think of, think of Jesus coming in a, in a town like Portland and everyone in Boston is rumbling around saying, are you hearing what's happening up in Portland? And then people from Massachusetts and the northern parts of Vermont and upstate New York start traveling to Portland, Maine to find out who this rabbi teacher is named Jesus. People descending upon this kind of obscure, beautiful area in northern Israel. And so what does Jesus do? He doesn't woo them all in. He doesn't say, hey, 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 come, come into the synagogue. Let me teach you all. Let me just let you know about my kingdom. No, Jesus sees the crowds in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Right? And you say, why would he sit down? This was the posture of a rabbi. They would read the scroll they would step in front of the podium from where they read the scroll and they would sit at a posture of teaching, but not in a synagogue, on this hillside. And he draws his disciples to himself. I just want to show you a picture of the hillside. This is in Gal. This is in, um, at the Mount of Beatitudes in Israel. And this is believed to be the hillside that Jesus would have taught from. And off to the the bottom left corner would be where the Sea of Galilee is, and the downslope is where Jesus would have been proclaiming. The swale or the valley in the hill is enough to carry someone's voice, they estimate, to be able to speak to eight to 10,000 people. It's this naturally formed amphitheater, and it's beautiful. And so when you look at this hillside, this is where Jesus, the King Eternal, proclaims his kingdom. Pretty incredible that he's sitting in his creation. And so just note, who does he draw near to himself? The disciples. And we're going to see throughout this entire series that there's two people in this entire teaching that we have to identify with. The disciples or the crowd. Right? And this is, this is for us to really re reconcile this morning. Are we drawing near to Jesus and leaning into his teaching? Or are we sitting back and saying, I don't know what we believe about him? The miracles are true. The life transformation happens. We see the works happening all through the body here. But how many of us are really still standing in the crowd wondering, what would it actually mean to follow him? To listen to his teaching? To allow him to transform my life? And so, this is how Jesus starts his sermon. And I'm going to I'm going to read it slowly. And if I were to unpack every single one of these, we would be here a month of Sundays. So we're going to work through these and let it paint the picture of the condition of the heart that Jesus looks at when it comes to blessing. In verse 3 in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus starts, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who are before you. This doesn't sound like a kingdom. This sounds like the down and outcast people that we would throw to the side as we live into a kingdom of hustle and grind and earn and invest and, in, and just completely work out on our own and see if we can climb the ladder over people. Right? This is the kingdom that we would say, this is for the people who just aren't going to be able to make it in life. But when we really consider and hear those blessings pouring out over those people, isn't there something in each and every one of us that wishes that's who we were? That we were not just poor in spirit, but we hungered and thirsted for righteousness because we would be filled. That as we're pure in heart, we will actually get to see the face, the person and presence of God. That he cast this vision that no longer is my kingdom going to come with swords under the reign and rule of King David. No longer is it going to be violence and warfare that's going to usher in my kingdom. It's going to be peace and healing. And is that the kingdom that we're willing to usher in ourselves as his disciples? Are we willing to not be peacekeepers, but peacemakers? Stepping into tents, broken hurting relationships and environments to say, let me help bring peace in this situation. This is the invitation he has to his disciples. And imagine thousands of people, three or four of these auditoriums full on this landscape. And Jesus is really just teaching the four or five, maybe 12, maybe 20 people who have actually chosen to follow him at this very moment. That's who he's really te teaching to. And the crowd is just eavesdropping. What kind of kingdom? I thought this was the Messiah. I thought this was the one who's coming in the golden sash that we heard last week that Graham's talking about. White hair, wine press, treading Jesus. That's the Jesus we want. King of kings, Lord of lords. No, he's a rabbi casting a vision that knows the kingdom will finally come when he endures the cross. And so for us, as we're looking at a vision of the kingdom, this doesn't always fit our, men, our, our mental understanding of what it looks like to take a region. But this is the kingdom that Jesus is ushering in through us. And I'm watching it birth person by person, group by group, hearts flourishing, coming alive, recognizing that Jesus wants to restore this region through people like you and me. Every day, coffee shops, workplaces, school systems, permeating the kingdom of God wherever we go. Stepping into moments, offering, hey, can I pray for you? You seem like you're really suffering right now. Hey, let me tell you about what Jesus is doing in my life. I'm offering you a gift that I've freely received. Not being weird about it, but saying we are agents of a different kingdom. And we are surrendered to our king. And so when we look at our king, when we look at Jesus, we can't help but know the end of the story, right? Where our king wound up on a cross, a Roman crucifixion tool. And we say, that's, that's not necessarily the kingdom of our heart. Are we really willing to die? Are we really willing to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross and to follow him all the way to Calvary? I have to imagine these disciples that walked with Jesus, that saw his kingdom coming, that saw the blessing pouring out in their midst as they lived into being poor in spirit, as they lived into seeking and thirsting for righteousness, as they lived into the reality of being pure in heart, seeing the Son of Man transformed in front of them. They realized that his kingdom is one of blessing, and they're willing to pay anything to be a part of that kingdom. Right? And we, we try to manufacture blessing, right? We try to create our own kingdoms of blessings. May, I might call them corrupt fiefdoms, 
right? When we all have our little piece of property and our, our comfort and our, our box that we're just curating and we're making happen and anybody comes in and kind of knocks over our house of cards, we're like, hey, that was mine. I was working really hard on that. I get it. It's happened to me. And we find ourselves defending a kingdom that's not of the kingdom of heaven. And yet Jesus is saying, if you want to experience blessing, supernatural outpouring of God's favor on your life that you can't understand, if you want to experience that, live into his kingdom. Find yourself recognizing the poverty you really have in your spirit without him. Begin thirsting and hungering for righteousness. Seeking out opportunities to be merciful to other people. Being peacemakers. Living into this kingdom. This kingdom is one of blessing. And for those of us that this is much of a contrast for, myself included, those of us who consider ourselves disciples, I wonder sometimes, is this our daily disposition? Is this who we're known to be by those closest to us? Right? I look at the close friends and family in my life, and, and is this what's radiating out of my life? Are they saying, no, Kenan's merciful. He's so merciful. He makes peace in anything that he comes into. He thirsts and hungers for righteousness. Go down this whole list, and Ashley would sit there and say, nope, nope. Um, mm, nope. <laughs> maybe on Sunday, uh, right? We all look in the mirror and, and we sit there and say, God, this is not who I am. And I think in this sermon, at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus would lean into his disciples and say, exactly, you aren't. But I'm going to be your righteousness. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to unveil my kingdom day by day in this walk with you every single step of the way. Because many of us will try to exert this. We'll sit there and go, okay, last week I got that. I'm pure in heart and I saw God. That was great. I'm a peacemaker because I did that at work. Okay, I'm a child of God. Right? We try to earn this as a checklist because we're going to try to hustle our way into his kingdom. And Jesus would sit there and say, you still don't get it. Go back to the top. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We recognize without him, we are truly bankrupt. And so I just want to give us also a, a bit of a history lesson because for the Hebrew people sitting on this hillside, this would be an absolute, complete breakdown of everything they've understood about the Messiah. Right? The Messiah was supposed to be one that came from the line of David, that came to restore Jerusalem and Israel back to God's holy people. He would have been God in flesh, walking the earth, restoring his kingdom. And so rumors, I'm sure, would have been going around saying, the Messiah is here, the Messiah is here. And he goes to open his mouth and teach. And they sit there and say, well, that's not what I thought he'd say. And so back in, in Exodus chapter 20, this is what many of the Hebrew people would have been thinking back upon when they understood that the Messiah was coming, that he'd come to fulfill what had happened at a mountain called Mount Sinai, which was not in the Galilee region. It was in this desert peninsula east of Egypt where the people of Israel were wandering around trying to find out who this Yahweh is that has delivered them from the Egyptians. And so in Exodus chapter 20, the people of Israel are, are kind of crowded around the base of this mountain. And when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to, at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. As I read this this week, I said, man, wouldn't that be a good thing for the church to taste a little bit, myself included. The fear of God to keep us from sinning. I don't know how many of us actually wake up every morning trembling under the reality that our Father is the glorious creator of the universe. The one who ordains everything that occurs in our lives. The one who just through the dust drew up Adam. 
and also made Adam return to the dust. How many of us wake up and realize that in a moment through billowing smoke and lightning, you and I could be gone? Now, we don't have a wrathful God in Christ Jesus, but that is his nature. He's a holy God. And how many of us actually wake up saying, Lord, remind me of your glory and your holiness because that is who you are, Father. Moses is saying, this is good for you, Israel. It's going to keep you from sinning against him. And we all know how that went. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites this, you have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. This is Yahweh, the God of Israel. The mighty hand that drew his people out of Egypt is on the mountain and the Israelites are trembling and shaking. And contrast that with Jesus the rabbi seated on a mountain, ushering the kingdom of God in a way of blessing. The Israelites don't know what to think about this. If this is him, if this is the Messiah, if this is the son of God, what happened to wrathful almighty God on Sinai? And we're going to understand that as we journey through the Sermon on the Mount. Because what I want to share this morning is that Jesus has come to fulfill fulfill the law, and not only fulfill the law, but fulfill the wrath of God for those who sin against him by taking it upon himself on the cross. And he looks at you and I as he hangs there, and he says, it's finished. Now take up your cross and follow me. And that's his invitation for his disciples. And so there's this holy shaking that's happening on the mountain, and you think, well, Israel must have learned at that point, right? Right? Israel must get it. If we, if we walked up to, we took a big journey up to Mount Katahdin, right? And, and God just descends upon Knife's Edge Ridgeline and there's shaking and there's fire. I don't think any of us would forget that, right? We would, we would sit there and go, okay, we, we get it, God. We're going to go home and we're going to figure out what we do with this. Well, what the Israelites did just days later is they end up crafting this golden calf, a god of gold, because they're sitting there going, well, we don't know what happened to Moses. Seems like the storm's still happening. We need a god. And the trembling, mighty, crashing, clashing one on the mountain wasn't good enough. This golden calf will do. And they said, this is the god that brought us up out of Egypt. Now, let me just dabble a little bit in the culture we're facing today. We may have built more golden calves in the name of Jesus, Christianity, and the church than we might realize. Because we might not be able to differentiate sometimes between really good curated spaces and the holy presence of God. We might look at this golden calf and say, there is this thing, this thing we've created is God himself who has rescued me. This thing, place, organization has changed my life. And here's Jesus on the mountainside saying, I'm Yahweh. Don't forget, I'm the one doing this work. And you can be in relationship with me. I think in the next few years, a lot of leaders, myself included, are going to have to assess. Maybe we were like Aaron the priest at the bottom of the mountain creating golden calves because it kept people's attention. When Yahweh himself is on the mountain saying, hey, people, come near to me. Don't fear. I'm your father. And how many of us here are willing to go up that mountain like the disciples towards Jesus and go up that mountain like Moses to say, Father, I trust you. And I want my life changed. That's the invitation he has. And not to say that spaces aren't great, worship's great, the lights, the worship, the volume, we all get caught up in this communal presence where we're worshiping God together. It's one of the most beautiful things that I get to be a part of in my life is in this space. But man, can woe to us if this becomes the golden calf of our lives. Woe to us if programs or organizations or movements or all these things that are branded and curated to keep people attracted to it Woe to us if we let that become our God. Because God says, there will be no other God other than me. And he will have his way with us. And I believe as we lean into Jesus' kingdom, 
his very simple, beautiful kingdom, we can't go wrong. If you and I walk up that hillside as the disciples, pushing our way through the crowds, and we lean into Jesus' teaching every single day through his word, through prayer, in small groups, leaning in saying, Jesus, what do you have for me today? I want to walk in obedience. I want to actually respond with my life every single day to your spirit. Jesus is going to teach us way more than we could ever imagine. He's going he's gonna to lead us into his kingdom. We're going to see healing and we're going to see transformation in greater Portland that none of us could manufacture or fathom with programs or strategies. It's going to be by his spirit going before us. But we have to step forward as his disciples. We have to say we want to be subjects of your kingdom and we want your kingdom to come in power. And so Jesus goes through the blessings he teaches the blessings to the disciples and the crowds are overhearing it. And then Jesus, I can just imagine, leans his disciples in and says, hey, let me tell you this earth shattering secret. I might be the Messiah, but I have something for you. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And on this hillside slope in Israel, I could just imagine Jesus reaching into the earth and sifting through the dirt that would have been filled with all these minerals saying, you're the salt of the earth. You might be few, but you're potent. You preserve decay. You bring flavor into the life. Disciples, you are the salt of the earth. If you think someone else is gonna do it, it's gonna be my spirit through you. And he looks at every single person in this room that says, I'm following Jesus as one of his disciples. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. He says, you're the light of the world. And there's the hillsides around the Sea of Galilee. All of these towns would be built in these villages and they would light their, their lamps at night and they would have this illumination happen across the sea that you can even see today as people turn on the lights in these towns. There's these, these pockets of light all around this lake and it's the most beautiful thing. It's like, it's like seeing the white, the white lights at Christmas. And so Jesus is pointing, I'm sure, to these towns saying, you're the light of the world. Imagine the illumination that rings out over to the cross of the, over across the Sea of Galilee. This is who you are. You cannot be hidden. My prayer for Keith and all those that are baptized is they radiate so much that people are like, whoa, dude, what happened to you? I chose to follow Jesus and I can't hide it. Don't put a bowl over me. Don't snuff me out. Anybody remember that song? I can't remember it now. This little light of mine, I'm going to, right? What if we lived our lives like that? Francis of Assisi says, all of the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of a single candle. And we sit there and go, oh, not in Portland. We can't do it in Portland. All of the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of a single candle. All of the darkness in the world could not overcome Christ Jesus and cannot overcome his church. And so for us, may we go boldly, knowing that we're potent and we're radiant. His kingdom is one that is potent and radiant. It's not one that's passive. It's not one that's lukewarm. It's not one that's kind of dim and you're wondering like, oh, is there any life left there? You can kind of Taste it in your mouth and spit it out. It's bland. No, his kingdom is potent and it's radiant. And I think the church more and more in this landscape needs to embrace his kingdom again of potency and radiance. And so for us, Jesus is looking at us saying, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so as we head into this series, I'm supposed to close right now. I could go for another 30 minutes. <laughs> so as we head into this series, this season as a church family, this is a season of preparation. 
I believe deeply in my soul. Our team believes it. Our elders believe it. We believe this is a season of preparation for our church to get our houses in order, to start understanding what it means to follow Jesus day by day, getting in the rhythms of reading our Bible every day, praying to God, knowing who he is and learning what it means to abide. Because I believe God's favor is about to pour out over this region. I believe that his spirit is about to draw people. And are we as a church ready to receive them and disciple them? Are we creating a culture here that resembles Jesus' kingdom so that God can entrust us with hearts and minds that need healing? They're broken. They're desperate. They're full of anxiety. And are we a potent, radiant church ready to receive them? You know, the author of Hebrews, well, let me just say this first. It sounds overwhelming, but his kingdom is simple. That's really important for us to recognize. Hard? (laughs) You better believe it's hard. Following Jesus is not easy. He says, enter through the narrow gate. Narrow is the road. Difficult is the road. Hard is the road. Crushing is the road. But it leads to life. It's hard. But man, it's pretty simple. Jesus paints that picture by being on a hillside in Galilee. My kingdom is pretty simple, guys. This is what it looks like. And are we willing to embrace this simple kingdom as we move forward in this season? And the author of Hebrews was writing to a a majoritively Jewish community, helping them reconcile what these people, these crowds were trying to reconcile on the hillside slope, right? This is a, is this Yahweh? The trembling, holy mountain Yahweh now turned Messiah, Jesus from Nazareth? Well, the author of Hebrews says this to his Jewish audience. He says, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, blood and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. He's telling the church, that's not who you came to. You came to the fulfilled version. You've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks today, church. May we not refuse him who's speaking to our hearts. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God, you can say it with me, is a consuming fire. Yahweh on the mountain at Sinai, Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount in the hillside of Israel. And just like last week, as Graham preached, there is a consuming fire Jesus that will once again shake the heavens. And I believe he's preparing us. For what timeline? I don't know. But may we be a prepared active, potent, radiant, kingdom-seeking church here at East Point Christian Church. Amen. As we look at communion, the author of Hebrews had to highlight that Jesus came in the way of a new covenant. The Hebrew people didn't have context for old or new like we do. They just had the covenant, the covenant through Abraham. The covenant is signs in flesh to show who is set apart. And the author of Hebrews says there is a new covenant that this consuming fire Jesus didn't go right to Mount Zion. He walked up Calvary with a cross on his back. And he said, I'm going to pay for the sins of the people, not through fear and trembling and awe and glory on a mountain, but by hanging myself on a cross to pay for the sin of the world. You see, we all want the blessing. Blessed, 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 blessed are you, blessed are you. 
but all of us apart from Jesus, we're cursed by our sin, by our brokenness, by our pain, by our own rebellion, our own self-seeking. And Jesus through the Sermon on the Mount is reorienting their eyes, taking their eyes from themselves and pointing them towards heaven. And to say, if you want to be able to pursue this kingdom that's ushering in, you must follow me by denying yourself and taking up your cross. And so for centuries, the church has taken communion, again, not out of religion, but to say, I'm willing to deny myself, take up the cross, and follow Jesus. And so as we come to the new covenant, it's not one of self-righteousness. It's not one of hustle and earning and striving. It's a covenant of mercy, grace, forgiveness, and redemption. And so as we take the body, we're reflecting on that last night that Jesus was with his disciples. And he took the loaf of bread and he said, this bread represents my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. So we take the bread and the cup. The new covenant, the most, one of the most pivotal symbols of God's radical love for you and for me to draw us near to him so that we have a relationship with him was by the blood of Jesus. Perfect, sinless, spotless lamb slain for you and I so that we could have a passageway, a way back to the way, the truth, and the life to Jesus, his son. We take the cup in remembrance of him. Father, we... Oh, all we can do is get caught up in your presence. All we can do is, is bow at your feet. And I pray that you teach us to pray in this series over and over again. Teach us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life as it is in heaven that you teach us what it means to seek first and foremost your kingdom above all else in our lives. Jesus, that we would understand what you mean when you say repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Father, if there are areas that we need to repent, would you send your spirit and conviction over our hearts this morning? Would you show us our waywardness? Would you reveal to us our sin? Would you show us the path of redemption, reconciliation, forgiveness, whatever it is to make things right because we want to inherit your kingdom. If you're drawing people into baptism to declare you as Lord for the first time, Father, would you do that by your spirit? Would you minister in this space, not us? Oh, Holy Spirit, we come to you and we ask you to have your way with us as a church. We love you. We worship you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so today, would you just stand with me as we go into a time of worship? I want to I wanna introduce, uh, on behalf of our worship team, a new song. A new song that's actually called Simple Kingdom. And it's a new song that maybe you're familiar with, or maybe you're not. And my invitation is don't try to just pick up the beat and try to sing it so you can sing it on your ride home through the windshield. Reflect on the words, reflect on the lyrics. This is a moment of discipleship, a moment of response. And I pray that this begins, begins to thread its way through our worship over this season, that we begin declaring this as a church, whether there's a tune or not, that we want his kingdom to come here in this church. And may it be in this church. Amen. So would you please just join me in worship in this song, Simple Kingdom.
kingdom is simple, Lord, teach it to us. Your kingdom is humble, as humble as death. His king is a savior who gave his last breath. So may we die daily, our pride lay to rest. His kingdom is humble, and the broken are blessed. Hallelujah, hallowed be your name.
this is what we're made for. We're made to let Jesus reign in our lives. And if that's confusing for you, if that's contradicting to the way you see the world, I'd love to have a conversation with you. We'd love to have a conversation with you. We don't come in a way of authority. We come knowing we've freely received a gift that we cannot put a value on. And we want nothing more than for somebody to be able to receive this gospel gift that the King of heaven reigns here on earth and he's drawing people back to himself. This is our burden. And man, it's a simple kingdom. And so ask yourself this week as you go from here, Am I one of those disciples leaning in, sitting at Jesus' feet? Or am I in the crowd still, wondering, is he really who he says he is? Either way, let's go on this journey with Jesus together. Let's walk towards Jesus. Let's embrace his kingdom. Let's throw the things that hinder us away so that we can set our eyes fixed on Jesus and chase after him with everything we have. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let... Now, somehow I have to pivot to, we're having a party this afternoon, a block party. So that's gonna be outside starting around one. We'll be setting up from like 12.30 to one o'clock. So if you're back and you wanna help, let us know. We're gonna be setting up out in the parking lot. If you need prayer today though, this is the most important thing I can share right now. The garage room at the end of the turf is gonna have our prayer team in it. And if you've got something burdening, weighing on your heart, please, please, please stop in with them. Receive the healing Jesus has brought through his kingdom here. And otherwise, we'd love to connect with you after the service over here near Discover East Point. The turf will be getting set up and blocked off. So we hope to see you back. We'll have burgers and dogs and all kinds of crazy fun things going on. So bring your kids. We hope to see you this afternoon at the party. Have a great afternoon. Take care, church. We'll see you soon.